Amen. What a, what a great <clears throat> vision. I think the only discrepancy is that that guy may have had a little more hair than me. But uh, <clears throat> what, what an exciting time and an exciting day for us. Um, would you bow with me and uh, we're going to have a great time in God's Word this morning. Father, thank you so much for uh, this journey and for bringing us to today, a significant, significant day in the journey toward home free and toward your glory uh, in a new church building. And uh, I just pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to us, Lord, that each one of us in our hearts would capture the significance of what we are doing today and that you would be, be glorified in every heart. And we'll give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen. <clears throat> well, this is uh, an exciting day in the life of our church. Many of you here today have prayed and asked the Lord what you might give toward this effort to break ground on our new building and ultimately have a part in seeing the construction of this new strategic uh, mission station that's bu being built very close to the heart of Annapolis, uh, very close to the, to the Naval Academy, <coughs> and you have uh, recognized that your money is not your own. It is a stewardship that you are to use for God's purposes in your life and for the advancement of the kingdom. And I don't want us to miss the significance of what is happening on a big day like today, uh, there, there's a passage that sheds light on what we'll be doing at the end of the service. And I, I do want to say, if you're here for the first time, our church family has been preparing for this day for, for six weeks now, and really for longer than that. So we don't want you to feel any pressure uh, to, to give or to be a part. But, uh, you know, there's, there's a passage of Scripture that uh, I, I think will, will give great significance to what we are doing and what will be happening at the end of the service. And I think this passage is so encouraging. And my prayer is that your hearts would be supercharged with uh, excitement uh, and joy because of the work that you're going to be involved in today. Uh, be, before we, we give our offering uh, to the Lord this morning, uh, I want to tell a story that Jesus told and then from the story, draw some lessons and insights that, that I really trust will encourage your hearts. So first, we're going to tell the story. We're going to jump right into it. If you have an outline, it's in Luke chapter 16. <coughs> Excuse me. And the first thing I want you to see about this story is there is a sinful steward. In verse 1, it says, Now he, was, Jesus, was also saying to the disciples, there was a rich man who had a manager, and this manager was reported to him as squandering his possessions. And so you, there's this very rich man. He's so rich that he requires a manager to manage his sizable possessions in a state. And you'll remember that a, a manager is a steward, uh, and a steward is not an owner. A steward simply manages the possessions of another. And so this rich man has evidently gone on a trip and, and he's returned from his trip and it's reported to him that his manager has misused and squandered his possessions and he will have none of it. And so he calls this unjust steward on the carpet and in Donald Trump fashion tells him, you're fired, you're fired. And uh, which raises a perplexing problem for the steward in verses 2 and 3. It says, And he called him and said to him, What is this I hear about you? Give an accounting of your management, for you can no longer be manager. And the manager said to himself, What shall I do since my master is, is taking the management away from me? I'm not strong enough to dig, and I, I'm ashamed to beg. And, and so this, this manager, this steward, suddenly has a problem. He's facing an uncertain future. Uh, he's out of a job. He has no source of income. He's, he's limited. He's limited in what he can do physically. 
and uh, he's too proud to become a beggar, and so he, he faces this very perplexing problem concerning his future. And uh, the master makes a big mistake, uh, and, and that was to ask the steward to give a final accounting. It's, it's really not good business practice when someone is let go for cause. Their final day needs to be yesterday not today, but this scoundrel takes full advantage of every opportunity and his opportunity still with his master's money, and he's thinking about, excuse me, his perplexing problem, and he doesn't know what to do until he has a light bulb moment, which leads to a satisfying solution, a solution that was satisfying to him. Excuse me, just a second. <coughs> Uh, he said, I know, I know what I'll do, I'll do, uh, so that when I'm removed uh, from the management, people will welcome me into their homes, into their homes. And he summoned each one of the master's debtors, just, yeah, thank you, the master's debtors, and he began saying to the first one, how much do you owe my master? And he said, a hundred measures of oil. And he said to him, take your bill and sit down quickly and write 50. And then he said to another, how much do you owe? And he said, a hundred measures of wheat. And he said to him, take your bill and write down 80. And so this guy is the definition of shrewd when it comes to wisdom and planning concerning his future. He hatches this, this clever plot. While it remains for him to give an accounting of his, his master's business, he decides to go to his master's debtors and to make them beholden, beholden to him uh, so that, <coughs> excuse me again, uh, so that they will reciprocate with him when he approaches them in the future. He's thinking, when I need a new job, I'll, I can go to this guy or, or that guy and he'll give me a job or a place to live, I'll be set. And, and so now, perhaps it's months later when the bills, these guys' bills come due, and, it, and it, it becomes apparent to his master what the steward had done. And, and then we have in verse 8 uh, the, the perplexing praise. And his master, it says, praised him. Praised the unrighteous steward because he had acted shrewdly. He, notice he, he doesn't praise him for his deception, his embezzlement, his dishonesty, his disloyalty. But in, in, in this much he is to be praised, the master had to admit he was very clever, very ingenious in planning for his future. This guy <coughs> was a wizard at taking care of himself and making sure that he would have enough for his life on earth. And his master basically says, uh, you, you know, you're a pretty shrewd guy. Uh, you're, you're impressively shrewd. And he commends him, not for his irresponsibility, but for his shrewdness. And the word shrewd there, it's an adverb. And, uh, you know, basically it meant that, that he acted advantageously. He acted shrewdly, uh, it, it took, taking advantage of his opportunity he worked the situation. He, he manipulated the resources that were at his disposal to get the ends that he desired. And how did he do it? Well, he, he reduced the debt that they were all indebted to him, and he did immense good to these people that were indebted to his master, and now each one of them is obligated to him. And since they, they have this, this great obligation, because of his generosity to them, they owe him big time. And uh, he has a number of options because he didn't just forgive the debt of one. He went to all of the debtors, the indication is. So, I mean, he had options for the future. Uh, and he could pick the one that he wanted to go to. And, and folks, we, we see people doing this all the time in business. People are very clever. Um, <coughs> this uh, is just typical, sinful, self-protective, conniving, maneuvering. Uh, uh, businessman who, uh, who acts uh, for his own future with, with just a very clever, ingenious scheme using all the resources at his disposal to secure the future that he wants. Very clever. 
And, and now Jesus is finished with the story. And he gives us an analysis of the future planning with regard to the sons of this age and those who are the sons of the age to come. And we see Jesus, uh, from, from Jesus, that which is unfortunately often true, an accurate analysis in verse 8b, it says, for the sons of this age are more shrewd in relation to their own kind than the sons of light. He's, he's saying that very often, listen to me folks, those who are the sons of this age, he's talking about unbelievers, sons of darkness, those living right here in this time-space existence, and that's all they're living for. They are more shrewd in planning for their future here than the sons of light are shrewd in planning for their future, than believers are for planning their future. In other words, he's, he's saying that, that sinners are often more shrewd than saints. Uh, the sons of this age, the people of this world, not in God's kingdom, that are part of this temporal world, the kingdom of darkness, this kingdom of unrighteousness, the people not in God's kingdom, are more clever in securing their future than the sons of light. Uh, John MacArthur says the, the sons of this age have always been concerned about worldly, temporal, earthly, their, their, their future, because it's all they have, and they are very good at it. And you know what? It's, it's amazing, folks, when, when you look today at much that we see, uh, investment firms that build their advertising on you planning for, their, for your future, the Morgan Stanley, Dean Witter, Merrill Lynch, uh, Fidelity Investment, walk the green line. You ever heard that one? And don't get off of it, and you'll, you'll find the future that you've been dreaming of and looking for. We hear it all the time. Take care of your future. I mean, it's, it's incessant advertising. Take care of your future. Take, take care of it. Uh, you go through life, and you save, and you save, and you save, and you save. You, you pay it forward, pay it forward, and then finally you get to 65, and you're at retirement. And you, you're, you're there. And so you take a month and you pack your motor home and you head to Florida. And on the way, you pop an aorta on the way to Sarasota. <laughs> and it's over. I mean, it's all over. You, you planned and, and nothing happened. Legendary football coach Bear Bryant suffered a fatal heart attack in 1983, one month after he coached his last game of football. It happens all the time, folks, to people who are preparing to retire. All those years of sending it forward, send it forward. And, and maybe you live, you know, two, three years. Maybe you live to 70, but then you can't see as well. <laughs> you, 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 you can't hear as well. You, you, you can't, don't look at me, Barbara. You can't, you can't taste. And you go, so what's the point? What's the point? Yeah. <laughs> You know, you get there, listen, you get there, and you can finally buy your dream car, and they take your license away. <laughs> you, you don't want to go on any long trips through the, through the lines at the airport with a walker. I mean, come on. You know, uh, here, here's what James is saying. He's saying the people in this world lay it all out there using every kind of scheme and ingenuity conceivable for the little time at the end to make that comfortable astonishing effort and hours and hours and money goes into it. And when it comes to human life in this age, the world, people are amazingly shrewd when it comes to take care, taking care of their little brief future. And what Jesus is saying, the sons of light, which we are, according to Ephesians 5.8, 1 Thessalonians 5.5, 5, and John 12.36, the sons of light are not very good at planning for their future. Now, let, let, me, let me show you what I'm talking about. This will be familiar if you've been to Mariners for any length of time. This rope, this rope stands for your life, your existence, which we know will, will be in two places, two arenas, in time and eternity. The, the, the red part of the rope stands for your life, my life in time, but we are moving the white part of the rope, in the direction of eternity. And the, and the point of the illustration is this is short, and eternity is 
It's long. It's, it's long, long, long. And, and here's what we need to understand. When we cross from the red to the white into eternity, you're going to live in one of two places depending on your response to the gospel. Your response to the gospel. And it will be determined by your answer, my answer to this question, who is my master? Uh, there is a king in heaven, and his name is, is Jesus Christ, and the people that, that go to heaven and not hell, because everybody's going to go one of those two places, either heaven or hell, the, the people that go to heaven are the people that have bowed their knee to King Jesus. And, and, and the point of this illustration is, if you are one of those, you are going to live eternally, eternally, in, in, in his kingdom. And, and, and here's, what, here's what Jesus is, is saying. He's saying that, that unbelievers are incredibly shrewd in planning for the little bit of time they have left in the red part of the, of the rope. More shrewd than are believers in planning for what is going to be an eternity. And so, so here's, I mean, here's the big question for us as believers. It is this, how wise are we? How wise have we been in using our financial resources, money, possessions, and wealth to prepare for our future, to prepare for our future, uh, and, and not just the few little years that we may have left in the red part of the rope? Galatians 1, 3, and 4 says that we are living in, in this present evil age. That's, that's what it's called. And, and it's, it's not very long, folks. It, it's, it's not very long. It's, it's very short. The people that, the sons of this age really just have a short time left until they go to another eternity. James says it's, it's a vapor. This is a vapor that comes and, and it vanishes away. But, but the people in this generation work so hard to guarantee their little future at the end of the red portion of the rope what it will be. And, and the question is, what about us? What about us? What about the sons of light? Those who, whose life in this age, who have life in the age to come, those who are citizens of heaven, whose citizenship is there, whose inheritance is in heaven, I mean, how can we be so foolish in our preparation for our future that will last not just for a few short years, but forever and ever and ever? And, and, and so the question for us is, do we work as hard on the use of our material wealth, our possessions, our money for eternal purposes, or are we just pouring it into temporal purposes? That's the question. Do we have an eternal perspective on investing our resources? So that's the story. Now let's, let's move to the application of the story. It's about our future. And Jesus has just said a lot about this wicked, unjust steward. He said he's very shrewd in planning for his future. But the question for us and the encouragement from the Lord Jesus to every one of us is we need to prepare for our future as believers, which is not a temporal one, but an eternal one. And what are we to do? What are we to do in, pre in preparation for our future? Well, it, I mean, in a sense, it's not entirely different than what the unjust steward was doing. Uh, he, was, he was making friends uh, who would one day, very soon, welcome him into their homes. And now, now look, look at verse 9 and see, I mean, this is the application, this is what we are to do to prepare for our future. Notice what Jesus says in verse 9, key verse. And I say to you, make friends for yourselves by means of the mammon of unrighteousness so that when it fails, they will receive you into eternal dwellings. You say, Bill, what in the world does that mean? <laughs> I, I want to show you what it means. It contains some of the greatest instruction in the Bible regarding what you and I need to do to prepare for the future. It contains the greatest financial counsel I think you will ever hear. If you want to maximize your dollars, folks, this is it this morning. 
How do I prepare for the future with the money that I possess in the here and now? How do I prepare for the future with the, the money that has been entrusted to me? That's what this is all about. Now, before I give you, I'm going to give you Jesus' investment strategy, investment advice. <coughs> I, want you, I want you to understand some things concerning the nature of money. Luke, Luke 16, verse 9, refers to, look at it, the mammon of unrighteousness. That simply means that, that money is a part of this unrighteous age uh, in which we're, we're now living. Money is, is unrighteous in the sense that it, it belongs to this unrighteous passing world. It is an element of fallen society's experience. It belongs to uh, the unrighteous life among sinners. Uh, it's it's going to be burned up one day. It's going to be gone. It says in verse 9, when it fails, when it fails, when your time to deal with money is over, when, it, when it, it's going to fail. It's part of a fallen system. Now, now listen, money, money in and of itself is amoral. It's, it's neither good nor bad. But, but it belongs to this age and it is limited to this present age. And because of sin, because of sin and lust in the heart of a man or a woman, money can corrupt. In 1 Timothy 6 verse 10 it doesn't say that money is the root of all evil, but the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil, and some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. So, so unrighteous mammon, money belongs to this present evil age. You know, we, we got into a big discussion at our elder meeting on Tuesday night uh, what is unrighteous mammon? And we just kind of boiled it down to this. It's, it, we, it's worldly wealth. It's, it's money. It's what, it's what I've got in my wallet right now. You know, uh, right here, nine bucks. <laughs> that, I mean, that's, that's what it is. That's what Jesus is talking about when he's speaking of unrighteous mammon. And, and I, I want you to notice what Jesus says about money. He says, Make friends for yourself by means of unrighteous mammon so that when it fails, when it fails, they'll receive you into eternal dwellings. Money fails, folks. And it fails. Here are the two failures of money. Write this one down. Money fails to save. Money can't save you. Uh, money will not keep you from dying. Voltaire, the, the noted... Uh, infidel and French blasphemer said to his physician, I will give you half of what I'm worth if you'll give me six months to live. Didn't work for him. Queen Elizabeth exclaimed as she was dying, my kingdom for a moment's time. Money didn't save either one of them. Money cannot save you from death. More importantly, money cannot save you for what's on the other side of death, and that is when you and I will stand before a holy God in judgment. Money will not be able to save you. You will not be able to say, I have a billion dollars here, Lord. I mean, money can, can save people from a little jail time here on earth, but, but not in heaven. It will not be able to save you because it's not going with you. And even if it did go with you, it couldn't do anything to wipe out the guilt of your sin. It, it fails, and here's, here's the second way it fails. It fails to save you. It won't save you from death, it won't save you after death. It, it, it fails to stay. It fail, and by that I mean it fails to stay with you. You know, we, we carry money, it's with us all the time. I got nine bucks, woo! <laughs> you know, uh, but it fails to stay with you. You can't take it with you. You, you never see hearses pulling U-Hauls. Um, 1 Timothy 6 verse 7 says, we brought how much into the world? Nothing into the world. We're taking nothing out of it either. It, 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 it is only, money is only for this present age. It, it stays behind. And graphically illustrated in a story uh, that Jesus told in Luke chapter 12, 16 through 21. He said, the land of a rich man was very productive. And he began reasoning to himself, what shall I do? Same question as the unjust steward. Seven times that question appears in the book of Luke. What shall I do? 
What am I going to do about the future since I have no place to store this abundance of crops? And then he has his light bulb moment. Ah, this is what I will do. I will tear down my barns, build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, you fool. You're moving from the red part of the rope to the white part of the rope tonight. Your, your soul is required of you. And now, who will own what you have prepared? Answer, not you. Not you. So is the man who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Folks, did you realize five minutes after you're dead, somebody else will have your money. Five minutes after you're dead, your checkbook will be worthless to you, useless. On that day, when you check out of time into eternity, it won't matter if you lived in a mansion with a swimming pool or a shack on the other side of the tracks. Folks, think of it. All, all you live for, the accumulated wealth of a lifetime, everything you dreamed of, every cent you've saved, every investment, it is gone. It will fail you forever. After a rich man dies, people often ask the question, well, how much did he leave? The answer is all the, the, always the same, all of it, all of it. The question is not how much did you make. The question is how did you spend what you had while you had it? Did you buy houses, land, stock, furnitures, new cars, new clothes, jewelry? Was that the goal of your life? Is that what you did with your money? Did you use your money, the money that you have right now, to invest here or to invest for your future as a believer? Money is a failure. It cannot save you. It will not stay with you. You leave it all behind. And so the question is, if money is such a failure, what can we do with it now? What can we do with it now? Jesus gives us incredible investment advice. He first instructs us the place of our investment, and then the purpose for our investment. I want you to see the place of our investment, where we should invest in Matthew 6, 19 through 21. He says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves I love that. For yourselves, treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. You, could, you can flip that around and say where your heart is, there will your treasure be also. Because, because where, where your, your heart is, that, that's where you're going to put your money. If my heart's over here, my money's going over here. Isn't that right? You, where your heart is, that's where your money's going. My, if my heart's over here, my, my money's going over here. And so, so here's, here's what we learn from Matthew 6, 19 through 21. At the very least, we know that it is possible to take our money, our treasure, and invest it not just on earth, but in heaven. With our money, we can make eternal investments that will last forever. Which makes me think, how can we take this money, this wealth, this stuff that God gives us and be so stupid as to use it all to pad a few years of temporal life when it could be used to create a richness that will last forever? So, so the place of our investment, where should we be? Primary place of investment should be heaven, right? Bank of heaven, right? What's the purpose of my investment? This, this, is, this is exciting, folks. God, in his amazing grace, has infused the money that we have right now, the money that, that cannot save, the money that will not stay with us. He has infused that money with power to make friends. And not just any kind of friends, friends that will last forever, eternal friends. 
the unjust steward used his money, the money at his disposal, to make friends who would, in his very limited future on earth, uh, bring, allow him to come into their homes. He was planning for his future. But notice, notice what the Lord says we are to do with our money. He says in verse 19, And I say to you, I say to you, make friends for yourselves by means of the mammon of unrighteousness, so that when it fails, that is, when you die and your money fails to follow you into eternity, they, your friends, will receive you into eternal dwellings. In other words, he's saying, use your money now. Use your money now to prepare for your future by making eternal friends who will be a part of the welcoming committee when you cross from the red line to the white line and go into eternity. Here, here, write this down, folks. Here's Jesus' investment advice and strategy. The primary use of your worldly wealth should go toward making eternal friends. The primary use of your worldly wealth should go toward making eternal friends. You say, Bill, how, how does my money today make eternal friends? Whenever you give your money to gospel ministry, Whenever you give to a work that supports gospel ministry, you are making friends. Whenever you give to gospel ministry where there is the faithful preaching of the word of God and people are being saved from hell for heaven, you are making friends. Today, I want this message to be such an encouragement to you. Many of you today will be making friends, eternal friends today by giving to Breaking Ground, this campaign. And here's, here's how it will happen. If the Lord tarries through the gifts today and over the next three years, a building is going to be constructed over there on Maryland 450. And when people drive into Annapolis and drive toward the Naval Academy, they're going to see that building. And some of those people are going to be led to go inside to check out this new church. And someone's going to walk through those doors a couple of years from now and they're going to hear a message from God's word they're going to hear the gospel of the grace of the Lord Jesus and they're going to repent of they're going to turn away from their sins and they're going to bow their knee to Jesus Christ and they're going to get to know people in this church and they're going to have one-to-one -one relationships where they're going to learn more about the word of God they're going to be in growth groups and pretty soon they're going to be bringing other people to Jesus Christ and when their life on this earth is completed, they will go to heaven. And that person and many others will be a part of the welcoming committee that will welcome you into heaven. And that person will say to you, maybe something like this, thank you so much that you gave and sacrificed and planted seed on November 23rd, 2014, because guess what? I'm a part of the harvest of the seed that you have planted. I, I, did, I, I went to that church in 2017, and I heard the gospel, and I surrendered my life to Jesus Christ, and I have lived for his glory until he called me home from heaven uh, to heaven, and I just want to say thank you. Welcome home to heaven. That person is going to be an eternal friend one of a host of friends, perhaps, that you have made through the investment of your worldly wealth. Folks, i gotta, I got to tell you, this is becoming so clear to me. A huge part of what Jesus has called us to do on this earth is to make friends. We, that's what our church ought to be about, making friends through the use, not only of our treasure, but of our time and our talents. We're, we're about making friends. And, and, and do you realize what this is saying, this is a little window to what this is saying about our entrance into heaven. I don't believe it's going to be a quiet affair. I, do, do you ever think about what it will be like when you, you step from the red to the white, when you step out of this body and into eternal, uh, the, the eternal heaven, you know, with the Lord Jesus? I, you know, I think about that. And, 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 you know, I, you know, sometimes, you know, people may think it'll be like going to a Navy game. 
and you know, there's thousands of people there and you're standing in line, you know, cause they got to check your bags and all that stuff. And you got your ticket and you, you know, you just waiting in line and you go, you show your ticket and you go in, you know, pretty much unnoticed by throngs of people. Listen, folks, you will not need a ticket to get in because they, they're, they're going to know you. You will not be unnoticed because they know you're coming. This verse and others seem to indicate to me that our entrance into heaven will be more like stepping off a private jet to BWI Airport, stepping off that jet, the lone passenger, and there on the tarmac are tens, hundreds, maybe thousands of people welcoming, welcoming me or you home. Your home, people there holding up signs, welcome home. The band playing, welcome home. Who are they? They're the friends that we have made through the investment of our resources, through the investment of our time. My sense is that moment of stepping out of time into it will be the most exciting moment of our experience to date, certainly. But, but listen to me, hear me on this. The size of the crowd will not be the same for everybody. That is being determined right now by the friends we are making here. The size of the crowd, in some measure, will lay in how I invest my money in this life. Much of the reward that we will receive will be the reward of seeing our eternal friends. The Apostle Paul laid his life down for the Thessalonian church and the churches that he planted. He says this in 1 Thessalonians 2, 19 and 20. He says, For who is our hope, our joy, our crown of exaltation? Is it not even you in the presence of the Lord Jesus at his coming, his coming for me to take me home, and I'm going to get to see all you guys waiting on me? First, uh, 2 Peter 1, 11 speaks of an abundant entrance into the kingdom. Here's, here's Jesus' investment strategy. Place, heaven. Purpose of your investment Make friends. Make friends. You say, well, I, I don't have much, so I don't give much. If, if I had more, I would give more. No, you wouldn't. No, you wouldn't. You say, well, how do you know that? You don't know me. Well, I, I don't know you, but Jesus knows you. Look at the next verses. He says in verse 10, he who is faithful in a very little thing is also faithful in much. And he who is unrighteous in a very little thing is also unrighteous in much. Therefore, if you've not been faithful in the use of unrighteous mammon, who's going to entrust the true riches to you? Folks, it's, it's not about how much you have. It's, it's about who you are. It's about your priorities in this life. Whether heaven is in your heart, is where your heart is. Uh, faithful people are faithful people. <laughs> faithful people are faithful people. That's, that's very, very profound. Whether they have little or much. Unfaithful people are unfaithful people, whether they have little or much. If you're concerned about the advance of the kingdom, bringing people to Jesus Christ, making friends, uh, you will give generously and joyfully. You know, people say, well, well I'm just hoping that I'll win the lottery. <laughs> well, if you, if you won the lottery and do not go out buying lottery tickets, please. If you won the lottery, it wouldn't change your heart. The lottery can't change your heart. There's only one thing that can change your heart, and that is Jesus Christ and the gospel. And, and what Jesus is talking about here, when he's talking about very little, he who is faithful in very little is also, the, the money that we make and the wealth that we accumulate in this life to God is a very little thing. In the light of eternity, it, it's just pocket change. E, even the man who has millions of dollars only has very little in the, as far as God is concerned. A, a guy like, you know, Donald Trump or Bill Gates or whoever your rich guy is, only has peanuts. It's not how much you have. 
It's, it's what you do with what you have that matters. And the much there refers to the much of eternal wealth that God wants to give us. And, he, and Jesus is saying, if you have messed around and wasted your worldly wealth, why should I trust you with the stuff that's really important? That is to say, our, our future wealth depends on how we use our present wealth. What we have now, one day we're going to give up. What we have then, we'll keep forever. Verse 12, if you have not been faithful in the use of that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? Today's November 23rd. In about a week, if you're paid like me, uh, you'll receive a paycheck. And we'll put that in the bank, and then what, will we, the question, what, what are we going to do with it after? Will we use it well or poorly, faithfully or unfaithfully? What difference will it make how we spend that paycheck today, tomorrow? What difference will it make 10,000 years from now? If, if, if you see, if God can't trust us with piddling stuff that we call muddy, money, how is he going to be able to trust, entrust us with the true riches? The money we have is loaned to us. Someday we're going to give it back to God, and he's going to give it to somebody else. And so the question is not, how much did God give us? That, that varies from person to person. The, the bigger, more important question is, what have we done with what God has given to us? Did I store up treasures on earth or treasures in heaven? That's, that's a great question. We all need to ask it because, you know what? We're going to have to live with the answer to that question for a long time. And one more question. This is, this is really the all-important question. What does the use of our money say about who our master is? How we use our money really determines, reveals who our master is. And this is really the end of the story in verse 13. Look at it. Jesus says, No servant can serve two masters, for he will either hate the one and love the other, or else he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You, you cannot have Christ as a master and money as a master. Uh, you, 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 just, you can't have them both at the same time. There, there are two masters, frankly, that will never agree. <laughs> uh, you have to choose which one you will serve. And it's Best I can figure out, folks, the most important question you will ever answer in your life is the question, who's your master? Who is your Lord? Heaven depends on the answer to that question. And these verses teach there can only be one. There's not two seats on the throne. And, and there is no greater challenge to the throne of your life than the challenge presented by money. And that's why the Lord puts it the way he does in verse 13. And the only thing that can knock money off the throne, that can break the grip of materialism and greed in your life is the grace of the Lord Jesus. We know the grace of the Lord Jesus. That though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor. That, that, that through his, he through his poverty might make us rich. So, Who's on the throne of your life? That's, that's a good question. And the problem is, folks, the problem is that you don't have an eternity to figure out the answer. you got the red line <laughs> to figure out the answer. So many people today are living as though they will live forever. I mean, that's how people are living, just as though they're going to live forever. Investing in this world as if it were the final world. And they are blind to reality. Let me give you reality. Here's a dose of reality. One day you're going to die. And we're going to put you in a box. we you in here. I've done this many, many times. And we'll say some nice words. We're going to cry a little bit. We'll wheel you out to the hearse, take you to a cemetery. Say some more nice words, have a prayer, drop you in a hole, put a flower on it, and throw some dirt on top. And then we're going to go back to your house and have a party. 
And that's reality. That is reality. But some of us think it's never going to happen. I'm, 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 I'm just here indefinitely. We think we're never going to cross the line into eternity. But we are. I want you, this is on your outline, turn to John 15, John chapter 15, verses 12 through 14. So, what is the Lord Jesus saying to us in the light of this coming eternity? He's saying, he's saying to us, here's the big message, prepare for the future. Prepare for that day when you're going to meet me. Make friends. And folks, first, the most important friend that we need to make, would you agree with this, is the Lord Jesus. He's a judge to the sinner. We need to make the Lord Jesus our friend. And there's only way to become the friend of Jesus, and that is to know the gospel, that he loved us so much he went to hell for us, so that he wouldn't have to live in heaven without us. He, he loved us so much, he paid the debt he didn't know because I owed a debt I could not pay. And, and because of the gospel, I repent of my sins and bow my knee to the Lord Jesus Christ. Then he becomes my friend. He becomes my friend. You say, Bill, how do you know that you become the friend of Jesus? Look at John 15, verse 12. Jesus says, this is my commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. Now, now look at it, folks. Underline it in your Bible. You are my friends if you do what I command you. You, you become his friend when you bow your knee to him and you begin to listen to his word, when you desire his will above your will. And when you become his friend, look at this. This is so exciting. Next verse. He says, no longer do I call you slaves, for the slave doesn't know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that, the things that I've heard from my father, I have made known to you. If, if you have become a friend of Jesus, he has let you in on one big, huge secret. You've heard it today. An investment secret. He's saying to us, you can, with, with your money, with this right here, with your money, you can make eternal friends. who will be on your welcoming committee when you get to heaven. Make friends now. You, use, use your money today to make friends that will be there to greet you when you go to heaven. Make friends who will be thankful for you, who will cheer you on when you arrive in eternity. And folks, this isn't selfish. This is something Jesus encourages us to do. Look at, he says, make for yourselves. Make for yourselves, friends. It, it's, I, you know, store up uh, tre for yourselves treasures in heaven. No, 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 no. Th this, is, this is what life should be about as a believer. And so I ask you this morning, how are you doing at making friends? Make friends through the use of unrighteous mammon. It's just money. Invest in gospel work. Invest in home free. L listen to his instruction again as we close. Verse 9, And I say to you, make friends by means of unrighteous, the mammon of unrighteousness, so that when it fails, they, your new friends, will receive you into eternal dwellings. I'm going to ask Ben and the worship team to come up right now and we're going to have a song and as this song is played we're going to encourage the parents uh, to go out and find your children because we want them to be a part of this uh, Making Friends campaign today and uh, 
I'm going to give you some instructions in just a moment. But let me ask you to stand right now. Let's stand up.